my work was meant to provide the basis for an Ethereum 2.0. The internet computer is thousands of times more efficient than these blockchains. You can build a social network on the internet computer and run it from the internet computer and you can't do that with Avalanche, Solana, Ethereum and so on. Fourth. All right, everyone, welcome to the interview with the one and only chief scientist and founder of Defini, Dominic Williams. How are you doing today? Good, Aaron. How are you doing? All right, so guys, this is going to be a big, big interview. We're going to start with the first question. Dominic, how did you get into crypto? Um, well, it was a kind of slippery slope because I started using a library called Crypto++ back in, um, I guess, 1999. And um, this was created by a guy called Wei Dai. I was trying to create my own kind of certificate system, a bit like X509, but certificates that you can mm -hmm. copy and paste in text. And um, on his, on the website he had, um, where he made this crypto library available, he, he wrote something about B money. And um, to be honest, I couldn't make head or tail of it, but I, I saw that it was something interesting. So I, I kind of like, you know, come across some of that cypherpunk thinking early on, then spent a lot of time, um, you know, uh, messing around with cryptography and distributed computing and so on. And when Bitcoin went through its kind of um, uh, one of its early pumps in April 2013, mm -hmm. um, it grabbed my attention because I was just at a certain point yeah. uh, in, in my life where I could sort of give it a bit of attention and, and you know, I was almost immediately hooked and I was working full time in crypto by by the end of 2013. Yeah, that's funny because 2013 was the first time I actually heard about crypto. I mean, I was like 11 or something at the time, wow. but I was a, you know, the when Bitcoin went, made that first initial pump, I think it was $300. That made a lot yeah. of noise and went all, all over the news and all of that. So yeah, that was cool. And then to- And uh, you're, not, you're, you're a crypto native. You're the crypto native generation. Basically. Yes, yeah. yes. Everyone, the Gen Z, we are the crypto native generation. All right. And to my next uh, question. So you had some projects you, you know, you made before the internet computer. What were those projects and how did you actually, you know, I, you kind of elaborated on this in the first question, but like, what were some of these projects you worked on? Huh. before the internet computer? Well, I mean, they're, they're probably, to be honest, too many to enumerate. Um, I mean, I started coding uh, more, more than 40 years ago. Um, and I started out just with a ZX81 and coding, trying to trying to code Space Invader games because, you know, that's what I saw in the pubs of England and I wanted to mm. emulate them. And, um, but, you know, much later on, I, you know, when I got serious, I suppose, um, the, the first big thing that I uh, created was a thing called Smart Drives. And uh, that was a sort of innovative um, uh, online um, file storage system that used differential compression. And um, towards the sort of end of the dot com era, you know, I was trying to establish the world's first, what would have been the world's sort of first true cloud computing service where people could um, store and share files, um, not with a website like Dropbox, but something more akin to, you know, a distributed file system. Um, that was easily installed. Uh, that got dot commed. We 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 almost um, got to roll it out through a company called Energist and FreeServe, and, which is the world's biggest ISP at the time. Energist um, uh, went into administration at the end of the dot com era, so that was the end of that. Um, I did quite a few things after that. I had a platform for uh, big commercial publishers. I had a thing called AirDocs, again a kind of uh, file transfer system that worked with low bandwidth connections, typically, you know, if people on the move with, with early 3G connections. Then I created a, a computer game, a massively multiplayer online game called Fight My Monster, mm -hmm. which grew to 3 million users. And that was the last thing that I did before I switched into crypto. Okay, yeah, and then to segue into that, into my next question. So when you dig a little bit into the crypto history and you go on the Ethereum YouTube channel, you f we find some videos about you speaking at the Ethereum conference and all that. So what was your involvement in the early Ethereum days? Just, you know, there are, for a bunch of different reasons. I think I was the first person in the crypto space really to be trying to repurpose something called um, Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, uh, sort of distributed computing techniques mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, the distributed computing sort of discipline of computer science. You know, that's for, you know, for a bunch of reasons, I believe blockchains could always scale, um, not least because with this game that I, you know, created Find My Monster, um, I'd scaled it to millions of users with not many resources using a, a database called Cassandra, which is a kind of sort of decentralized database. And I'd created a horizontally scalable game server and things like that. And, uh, you know, initially when I got into crypto, I'm like, okay, I'm going to create a cryptocurrency f um, for the games industry so people can uh, buy and sell virtual goods and move the value between games. 
and I'd done the calculations and realized that you, know, you couldn't just copy paste Bitcoin. You needed a completely new uh, kind of cryptocurrency. You know, I'd been working on that. And, and, and in 2014, I was you know, a pioneer in, in the crypto space. Mm-hmm. I was the first person trying to repurpose traditional Byzantine fault uh, consensus uh, distributed computing techniques mm-hmm. for the decentralized setting. You know, I think, you know, there was a paper called Pebble, uh, which I published at the end of October 2014. So I published it, I only really distributed it to to industry insiders. Vitalik Buterin had a copy, Nick Sava had a copy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, you know, it was through that, you know, I, I got involved with Ethereum and, you know, I, I knew a lot of the founders, particularly I spent a lot of time, saw a lot of people like Vitalik because there was this kind of, if you like, a traveling circus yeah. around the early Ethereum community. Mm-hmm. We used to, you know, just travel all over the world to these different kind of conferences <laughs> and meetups and discuss different ideas. This was before, you know, Ethereum even launched. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, I participated in the the Ethereum uh, crowd sale too. During that time, yeah. I was... Uh, promoting my kind of particular take on how blockchains should be designed, mm-hmm. of course, already, and uh, trying to explain how, you know, these te- mathematical techniques I was using could be applied within, you know, decentralized blockchains. And that was kind of uphill battle because, I, you know, I'd invested a lot of time mm-hmm. understanding these things. And, you know, I've been playing around with, you know, cryptography and distributed computing techniques for a long time and, and also scaling, you know, systems mm-hmm. to millions of users. And here I was, you know, I'd become the specialist in this particular kind of quite arcane sort of discipline from computer science, um, which now, of course, nearly everyone, you know, is drawing on. But back yeah. then, no one understood. So I was, you know, I was advocating for, for this kind of approach. And then while I was part of this early Ethereum community, mm-hmm. um, I heard uh, this this phrase, world computer. Uh. And I'm like, all right, world computer, yeah, okay. Now, my interpretation of that phrase was very, very different to other people's interpretation of that mm-hmm. phrase. Um, you know, Ethereum at that stage was still conceived as basically a sort of world calculator mm-hmm. um, where maybe you could do th- three three transactions a second or something. Yeah. And that was deemed adequate. When I heard the phrase world computer, I'm like, okay, well, actually, when you build on a blockchain, um, because I spent a lot of time thinking about what a smart contract is. Yeah. And smart contract is really a new kind of software with some amazing properties that you just mm-hmm. can't get from traditional software. So a small contract's tamper-proof. You know, you don't need to protect it with a firewall, right? Yeah. You know, Bitcoins aren't protected with a firewall. Smart contracts on Ethereum aren't protected with firewalls. And and systems you built from smart contracts on the internet computer are protected yeah. by firewalls. That's an, a huge advantage, especially in, you know, today today's age is, you know, systems and services increasingly get hacked and encrypted with ransomware. Secondly, smart contract software is unstoppable. Another huge advantage. Thirdly, um, it can process tokens and things like that. Mm-hmm. Another huge advantage. And fourthly, you can make it autonomous, which means mm-hmm. you can have code that doesn't have a human owner or controller. Um, it can exist, exist independently of a person yeah. or a company, mm-hmm. right? So that's very useful for creating sort of, for example, international financial rails, but also, you know, in my mind, uh, <laughs> for example, a social network that runs under the control of a DAO. Right? Yeah. So to segue into my next question, uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit. So when did you get the idea for the internet computer? How did that come about, Definity, all that? How did the early thinking process begin to, you know, form this whole thing? Yeah, so when I heard this phrase, world computer, I, I, I actually abandoned the, the Pebble project, which was this, um, you know, scalable cryptocurrency um, that was um, had a slightly different focus. It was designed for the games industry and, and for recurring payments and social media and things like that. But you know, it was it, it, it used some in, did some interesting things, used some interesting math, and people can find it on. There's a wiki page detailing the history of the internet computer. The, the papers up there. But once I heard this world word world computer, I'm like, all right, that's what actually needs to be built, and I want to build that. Um, so. I sort of pivoted, I really abandoned Pebble and, and pivoted. The name uh, Definity was adopted early in 2015. And initially, my work was meant to uh, provide the basis for an Ethereum 2.0. Mm. And if you look at um, you know, Ethereum 2.0 now, actually it's um, uh, very similar to the kind of things I was proposing early in 2015. But mm-hmm. you know, what I wanted was an infinitely scalable blockchain, or at least you know, something that could scale without bounds and that provided a single seamless environment you mm-hmm. know so you, it wouldn't matter too much what 
shard you're on, if you want to call it yeah. a shard. I mean, we have subnets. <laughs> yeah, these things should be combined into a single environment. I wanted smart contracts to be able to serve web and so on and so forth. So, you know, my original work was really um, meant to provide the basis for an Ethereum 2.0. And that's why you see, it, see me giving a lot of talks on, you know, different techniques that can be used that I've devised. Uh, at a theorem conferences like DevCon One and and also thing you know San Francisco Bitcoin meetups and things like that back in 2015. But eventually, you know, I, I realized that you know people were so set on proof of work, yeah. and you know the difficulty of communicating the power of the kind of mathematics I was using was just too great. It was just going to mm -hmm. be an uphill battle, and you know people wanted to get to market quickly and get tokens up for sale and all that kind of stuff and. You know, I realized that there'd be quite a lot of R&D involved to produce something like the, what is now the internet computer, which yeah. is, I think, the world's first world computer mm -hmm. uh, enabler. Um, and so, you know, it became a different project and, um, you know, really uh, we, we managed to start getting, getting funding, funding directed toward it in, in sort, of, uh, uh, sort of spring of 2016. Definity Foundation credited uh, October 2016. And then there was uh, a public ICO February 2017. And, uh, you know, that then began, you know, several years of hot R&D. All right, that sounds really cool. Now to my next question is, so what makes the internet computer actually different from all these projects? So you got Solana, Avalanche, Near, Ethereum, and then we have the internet computer. So what makes it actually different? If you could, you know, give a couple of things. Yeah, I mean, it's, this, it's so different. It, yeah. It's almost, um, I think, hard to for, for, the, for the average. Yeah, if you can make it into on. a simple way for you know the viewers well, to mm -hmm. understand. In so the simplest form. yeah, so look, first of all, uh, a public blockchain uh, is something that's created by a public protocol, mm -hmm. um, which has mathematical properties, and you can prove that the protocol is mathematically secure and. and prove things about, you know, um, its resistance to attacks and liveness properties and so on um, using mathematics. So the internet computer protocols, together termed ICP, are mathematically secure and the math proofs showing that they work. A lot of these protocols don't even have math proofs and formal descriptions yeah. associated with them. So it's a very different kind of thing. Um, that's the first point. Second point is the properties uh, of these blockchains are vastly different. The internet computer is thousands of times more efficient than these blockchains. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can build a social network on the internet computer and run it from the internet computer. And you can't do that with Avalanche, Solana, Ethereum, and so on and so forth. And the problem I think we got communicating these differences, mm -hmm. and there are huge differences. Look, on the internet computer, it's, you know, smart contracts can store and process data mm -hmm. with thousands of times more efficiency. Mm -hmm. They can pre-finalize transactions, and so transactions can serve web content. There's a thing called reverse gas, so smart yeah. contracts pay for their own computation. All sorts of things. They're really, you know, uh, very, very different indeed. But it's challenging to communicate the differences because of the deliberately deceptive and misleading terminology that people in blockchain use. So, for example, You'll often hear something like, oh, look at this Web3 service, it's built on Solana. And yeah. that's just not that's just not true. You know, um, it's not built on Solana, it's built on Amazon Web Services. And then, you know, all the data processing and content really lives there and the web experience lives there too. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that service, which is obviously intrinsically insecure because it's running on Amazon Web Services yep. and subject to the whims of the developers and everything else, that service is then just maintaining a few tokens or NFTs on the blockchain and maybe some tiny clips of data. So it's not really built on Solana at all. You, you look at look into it further, you find that Solana is also running on Cloud. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a bunch of cloud. Yeah. You know, I look in reality like you know the probably you know three cloud operators, four cloud operators. Like yeah. um, used to be Hetzner, but they turned them off. Amazon and I don't know. And yeah. so um, you know, again, for someone like me, you know, who's been in crypto for a long time, I mean, is really a believer in something more than just the marketing. Yeah, um, that's <laughs> antithetical, right? I mean, I didn't get into blockchain to create a network that ran on top of Amazon Web Services. Yeah. You know, and so the internet computer uses something called uh, proof of use for work, and it's hosted by a network of these things called node machines, mm -hmm. which are specialized hardware. Yep. Um, they're very similar to um, like a blade server, but without any redundancy yep. inside, because the network provides redundancy, so no, you know, data doesn't have a, you know, redundant backup power supply, it doesn't use RAID for the mm -hmm. storage and so on. And, um, these node machines are, you know, owned and operated by independent parties from different data centers and different geographies and different jurisdictions. And the internet computer combines these node machines um, using internet computer protocol to create this giant world world computer which runs smart contracts. But it's a sovereign network. Yep. It's not running in the cloud. It's running on a sovereign network. It can't be turned off by big tech. And this is absolutely 
uh, essential to me. Yeah, because you know we've seen how big tech can just come and do whatever, and we've seen how Solana's blockchain has just completely shut down a couple of times. So obviously the infrastructure can't be too good if it's shutting down every other month. Yeah, and then to our next question. So to touch on a couple of things, a couple of big things that are happening in the internet computer ecosystem is the recent Bitcoin integration with CKBTC, and then the upcoming Ethereum integration with maybe some CK ETH. So could you elaborate on the integrations that have been happening in the past? You know? Yeah, so I mean, uh, for a couple of months now, um, the internet computer uh, gained some new chain key crypto capabilities that enables the blockchain to, on request from a smart contract, to give them a public key for which it doesn't have a private key and for the smart contract to create signatures against that mm -hmm. public key. So for example, you can use a smart contract on the internet computer to create Bitcoin addresses or yep. Ethereum addresses. And then you can get the blockchain to, um, you know, sign transactions, right? Yeah. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but we've also been uh, performing, you know, more direct in integrations of the network. So internet computer nodes actually talk to directly to Bitcoin nodes. And that makes it easy to um, send and receive Bitcoin from smart contracts um, just using APIs that the internet computer provides, um, which obviously is a, you know, kind of in itself is one of the things that's difficult people to take on board like what well, you can you mean you can have a bitcoin address and there's no private key the, yeah. the whole blockchain needs mm -hmm. to create the signature to move it um but yeah this is actually already working you know you can send and receive bitcoin directly on the bitcoin blockchain no bridges using these internet computer apis chain key bitcoin is almost like a kind of layer two on the internet computer for bitcoin mm -hmm. and it provides um, digital twins for Bitcoin, where you can send and receive Bitcoin in one second. So you could use it as an alternative to the Lightning Network. Now that thing uh, is technically complete, but it hasn't, um, the, you know, everything on the internet computer is updated by proposals to yep. the network nervous system. Uh, no proposal has gone in to, if you like, completely unlock its capabilities yet, mm -hmm. because it was seen that there's some issues with um, tainted Bitcoin. Yeah. So one of the issue, one of the um, challenges with Bitcoin is because of the UTXO model, it's possible to treat coins almost as though they're separate entities, right? So if a coin passes through the hands of you know a North Korean hacker, say, it becomes yeah. tainted, <laughs> and um, the danger is that you know somebody would use that kind of Bitcoin to create chain key Bitcoin, and then you know I could pay you in chain key Bitcoin, yeah. and when you tried to, you know, you tried to use that as normal Bitcoin, you'd find it was tainted and so perhaps you couldn't send it to an exchange or something yeah. like that. So currently, um, current, currently we're talking to a bunch of people that do um, this kind of on-chain analysis and will tell you if something's tainted or not. Now, of course, we can't use that directly. Uh, we're just another contributor to the internet computer. So yeah. we're looking for people that will, you know, interact with the protocol um, and essentially, you know, take payment from the DAO for these services so mm -hmm. that this autonomous code can just use a feature of the internet computer called HTTPS outcalls to reach out to these uh, providers in a decentralized way, find out whether the Bitcoin's tainted, um, and then if it's not, allow people to, you know, use it as chanky Bitcoin. These next two are going to be community questions. So on Twitter, you guys should be following my Twitter at Andrew <laughs> underscore. I asked, you know, you guys to submit questions for Dom. And our first question from coming from not dogfinity is what does Dom <laughs> do for fun outside of crypto? Ha! Well, firstly, my life these days, like, is, is pretty um, consumed, right, with um, not just my work here at Affinity, um, but also kind of complexes that have arisen literally from the, the nature of this crypto industry. So when we launched, we were under attack by, we came under attack by a number of nefarious parties. I mean, yeah. some of them are well known. I mean, yeah. Avalanche and Emin Gunsira had this law firm, uh, Roche Friedman, that, that really were, were incentivized with hundreds of millions of dollars of AVAX. Um, they credited class action and they did lots of other bad stuff. And so, for example, I had to spend some time dealing with that kind of thing. Um, Sam Bankman Friedman, it played the price. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a whole load of these kind of bad actors um, that created problems that I have to spend time dealing with. So, you know, I spend some time on that. Um, I also have, you know, family. Yeah. And so I try and spend time with my family. So, I, you know, I, my, my time is very, very constrained. Literally, it's, it's like either I'm, you know, um, just working on standard stuff for Affinity, whether that's, you know, uh, working on the website, you know, helping people, you know, describe things or, you know, working on the technology and the architecture and things like that. 
um, or just organizational issues. I mean, we're a big org now, yeah. right? And it's actually mm-hmm. a lot of work running a big org. Or it's trying to deal with these kind of uh, nefarious people and the problems they've created. Or it's just, you know, trying to spend time with my family. Yeah. Um, but if I, you know, if I do get time, um, skiing, I like skiing. I'm in Switzerland, yeah. obviously. What else? Um, skiing's... Skiing's the big one. Yeah, Dom's got a lot of cool videos of him skiing. You should definitely uh, share them on Twitter because they're really cool. Your next question from the community. So this is coming from Definity Deck. What is your thoughts of Vitalixing the internet computer as a sister network? Well, I, you know, we when we launched, we <clears throat> always um, we always thought we were completing a trilogy of yeah. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and internet computer, and that together, in a way, these things create a world computer. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, Bitcoin introduced you know cryptocurrency. That was the first major innovation. Mm-hmm. Then Ethereum came along and introduced smart contracts. And you know, people were messing around with ideas like you know, your counterparty and Mastercoin and all that kind of stuff. And Vitalik probably got the idea from his work on Mastercoin. Um, but you know, Ethereum really did introduce something new where, you know, you know, instead of having just script you attached to coins, now you have scripts living at their own addresses mm-hmm. um, permanently and they could send coins between them and things like that. And you know, smart contracts were sure and complete, of course. So that was the second innovation. Uh, and that really arrived six years after Bitcoin launched. Mm-hmm. And then if exactly almost six years after that, you know, the internet computer launched. And yep. the internet computer brought true world computer features with it. So now you had smart contracts that were immensely powerful, could store gigabytes of data, uh, ran in parallel uh, on a network that scaled and that could serve web uh, with reverse gas, with um, innovations like internet identity. So you could authenticate yourself to a Web3 service using the fingerprint sensor on your your phone or laptop, say. And so, you know, we we really did believe and continue to believe we're completing a, a sort of trilogy. And I think it'll probably be another you know, six years before we see another kind of big innovation like the internet computer, my guess. All right, cool. And that leads us to the final question of the interview. Dom, who do you think Satoshi Nakamoto is? Ha, huh. um, I always say the same thing. I, I think it's probably a group of people. I think Hal Finney probably was the uh, the center of it. And although Dave Kleiman could equally have be, been involved for some of the similar reasons, if you look at the code, um, you can kind of, uh, you know, the early messy C code, you can kind of like date the age and background of the programmer Mm -hmm. and um you know how finney was of that kind of age and had sort of messed around with all kinds of things including games programming i think um you know you can't ignore evidence like the fact that he got he received the first yeah (laughs) um, bitcoin transaction and you know as satoshi said he was moving on to other things you know and his involvement um declined Mm -hmm. um that correlated um, with Hal Finney's illness. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, for, for, there are lots of reasons like that. Well, I, 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 I um, say it's, it's Hal Finney. But um, actually, there are other, you know, in, in many other intriguing um, aspects to the whole Satoshi phenomenon. I mean, you know, Dave Kleiman's one, um, Craig Wright's another. Um, Dave Kleiman also um, was ill. Yeah. You know, and so, so arguably... Um, there's some correlation there with his mm-hmm. declining participation and uh, this health issue. And after, you know, how Finney was gone, there was this kind of message. But, you know, that message, I thought I recognized someone else's grammar in that. I won't say who. And mm. that would imply to me somebody else uh, I know had access to the keys. So I think it was a group of people, but um, I think probably the person in its core, the most sort of active member was probably Hal Finney. And, and I think... I don't, I don't know enough about Dave Kleiman. Maybe he was another one, which is kind of sad, right? Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're both dead. Um, but yeah, their, their invention lives on. Yeah, I completely agree. I do think it's going to be Hal Finney and uh, a couple other guys. It's also kind of interesting how Sato- the guy, a guy named Satoshi Nakamoto lived on the same street as Hal Finney for years. So that's another interesting y- thing. Yeah, totally. It's, it's, it's too much of a coincidence. Look, um, mathematically speaking, um, if you want to know the probability that something's true, um, you just take the number one and minus the probability that it's not true. Mm-hmm. So in order for it not to be true, mm-hmm. um, all of these things would have to be coincidences, right? Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> like... that, that, that this guy with the same name lived on his street, that, yeah. you know, his involvement declined um, in concert with his health, um, that he got the first Bitcoin transaction, yeah. etc., and all his past interests. So I think, you know, if you do a sort of take, you know, look at it in a kind of like mathematical way like that, it would certainly seem very probable that Hal Finney was deeply involved. All right, so that about wraps up the interview. Thank you, Dom, for doing this Thanks, interview. Everyone.
And yeah, guys, if you like this video, make sure to subscribe, like, leave a comment. I'm dropping weekly videos. And yeah, that's all we got. Thank you.